Firstly, it's important that we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional land we, uh, we meet tonight and, and pay respects to their elders, the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Secondly, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Blake Murphy in Alinka. Uh, it's really nice to have you here and see other um, faces amongst the crowd who have been, um, been coming to these Lionel Murphy re lectures regularly. I'd also like to welcome and thank ANU College of Law Dean Professor Stephen Bottomley, who's co-hosting this event, and um, also to thank the staff from Coast, especially Wendy Murring, um, and also Therese Douglas from the law faculty for all the work they've put in, um, both in relation to um, hosting this lecture, but also um, helping the, the, um, having the administration of the Lionel Murphy Foundation. The late Justice Lionel Murphy um, made a significant contribution to the development of Australian law and to the development of Australian political processes and to social reform. He devoted his career and public life to the achievement of a more just and compassionate society. And those of us who, like me, were glued to the television last night listening to the, the tributes to the great Gough Whitlam couldn't help but see Lionel Murphy in, in, in much of the footage. And of course, as Attorney General, he was also very, very instrumental in, um, in, in passing the, uh, the welter of reformist legislation in that period of three years um, of that extraordinary government. The Lionel Murphy Foundation was established after Lionel Murphy's death in 1986 to provide a permanent institution um, to honour the unique contribution to public life uh, in Australia of, uh, of Lionel Murphy. And the, amongst the foundation trustees were Gough Whitlam uh, and Neville Rand, both of whom um, have sadly died this year. And yeah, as I said yesterday, we were hearing lots of tributes to uh, to Gough Whitlam and both, both Whitlam and Rand being two giants of the Australian political and social scene. In relation to the foundation, um, Neville Rand um, basically car carried the Lionel Murphy Foundation for many years as we off administratively operated out of his office uh, and with his death, um, it's now been transferred over to, uh, to the ANU. Apart from... Um, what, what the, the main object of the Lionel Murphy Foundation is to provide postgraduate scholarships uh, which give opportunities to study law or science and other disciplines um, where there's um, some opportunity for some common good in Australia or overseas. And over the years we've now funded 73 Lionel Murphy scholars since 1988 and, um, to the tune of something like 1.3, 1.4 million. Uh, and so that's the main activity of the foundation. The other activity is to hold these lectures. Um, and we've held um, a, a number of those since one each year since 1988, um, including a whole number uh, of very eminent speakers, Michael Kirby, Mary Gordon, um, to, um, Barry Jones, Jim Spiegelman, Julian Burnside. That's a very, very honourable list to it, George's. Um, adding tonight. It's great to see such a good turnout tonight and I think it's a tribute both to the speaker and also it reflects an, an interest in the topic. I think it reflects a thirst for a proper debate about the need for anti-terror laws, those that have already passed and, and those that are proposed. I think it's important to acknowledge that um, the climate for a considered debate is, un is broadly unfavourable. Um, the context is one of an imperative to be seen to be doing something. And as a criminologist, I'm certainly very familiar with, with this imperative, this idea that something has to be done, or at least seen to be done. And that something is so often the thing that's closest at hand, and often, in some sense, is the easiest thing to do, and that is change laws. It's a form of symbolism which, which um, placates the desire to be seen to be doing something. And one of the results of this process is often, it's a process which often produces bad law, bad outcomes, an overreach of the criminal law, a diminution of um, general rights and liberties and an expansion of state powers. It's a process that's often marked by extreme haste and by an impatience with contrary arguments. It's a process often marked by the, passing, the bypassing of legislative and public debate in favour of the exercise of executive power. It's a process often marked by a reluctance to examine, consider and debate the evidence 
for example, in this case, in relation to anti-terror anti laws, the evidence of the various reports of the former independent national security legislation monitor, Brett Walker QC. But of course, it's precisely at times of heightened political and public fervour around issues of national security that we need to take our time. We need to examine the evidence. We need to be wary of departing from our democratic and constitutional traditions. And we need to listen carefully to the courageous voices of experts such as Professor George Williams, who have and are continuing to make a detailed study of our anti-terror laws here in Australia and indeed globally. Professor George Williams is the Anthony Mason Professor at the Law Faculty in UNSW. I could spend a long time running through all his many achievements, um, but you want to hear from him. Um, he, he is an uh, Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow. Uh, he's in, uh, as such, he's engaged in a multi-year project on anti-terror laws and democracy. Um, he's written many books in the area of constitutional law, the Oxford Companion to uh, the High Court of Australia, Global Anti-Terrorism Law and Policy, and as a barrister, he has appeared in the High Court cases dealing with matters such as freedom of speech, uh, freedom from racial discrimination, the rule of law. He's served on a number of very important public inquiries, and as chair of a public consultation committee, he helped to bring about Australia's first state bill of rights, the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities. He's a regular columnist for Sydney Morning Herald, uh, a, a, a prominent media commentator, indeed a, a public intellectual of the very, very first order. And so tonight I welcome Professor Williams to speak to his topic, Does Australia Need New Anti-Terrorism Laws? George. Well, thank you very much, David, for that very warm and generous introduction. And let me start by saying what a pleasure it is to be here at the ANU, where I worked and studied for many years, and also to be talking about a subject that is such great contemporary importance. It's also a great privilege, of course, to be asked to deliver this lecture. I've attended many of these lectures, going back to Barry Jones's lecture here in Canberra in 1992. And uh, so it's quite an honour to be asked to give it this year. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and uh, to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Now, as is clear, this question of whether Australia does need new anti-terror laws is one of great contemporary concern, and I emphasise the word contemporary there because, in fact, next week, the Federal Parliament will be seized with the issue of whether to pass the Foreign Fighters Bill. Now, the Foreign Fighters Bill is an extraordinary piece of legislation. It's very large, running to some 160 pages, it deals with a wide variety of topics, and it's been described as something that is vital and urgent in order to protect the community from the gravest forms of harm. It's a law that is also very contentious, both in terms of dealing with existing anti-terror measures and in greatly expanding the reach of the government's powers in this respect. For example, by enabling for the first time uh, the government to declare areas on the planet to be no-go zones and to jail Australians for up to 10 years for entering those places. Now, a bill of this kind you would expect, I think you'd reasonably expect, would be the subject of a lengthy, considered parliamentary process. But unfortunately, the reality is going to be very different, as indeed it almost always is for these very large omnibus terror me measures, as was the case also in 2005 after the London bombings. We've had a rushed committee process uh, that led to largely cosmetic changes being recommended to the bill. Not surprisingly, given the nature of those changes, the government has accepted each of them, knowing full well that none of those changes deviates the government from its predetermined path with respect to the bill. Next Monday, the Senate will begin debating this bill. It will likely be passed by the Senate uh, the next day. That day, or soon after, it will go to the House of Representatives and it will likely, almost certainly, be passed by the House of Representatives by the time Parliament rises next Thursday. So in the space of a few days, this bill will go through both houses in a very quick and short order and be subject to the sort of debate that is extremely rare in our democracy, given the attention that Parliament normally pays to even minor pieces of legislation compared to this one. Now, this shortened timetable certainly matches the government's desire to have this urgent measure enacted as quickly as possible. And we know that the government almost certainly will get its wish in this respect. And that's because the opposition says it's lockstep with the government on this. 
And indeed, the opposition leader has written to the Prime Minister uh, guaranteeing that the opposition will facilitate the passage of this law by the end of this month. And of course, the end of this month is at the end of next week. So we have bipartisan agreement that pretty much no matter what, this bill will go through Parliament next week. Now, as I think about that process and this extraordinary bill, I must admit that uh, in preparing for this lecture, I started to wonder what Lionel Murphy would have made of this process. Because Lionel Murphy, of course, was one of Australia's great reforming attorney generals. He had notable achievements in family law, access to justice, trade practices, but he also had a particular passion and interest when it came to national security matters and our intelligence agencies. It's, of course, well reflected in the fact that he paid a visit, or what was called a raid, to ASIO's headquarters in Melbourne in 1973 to make the point about the ministerial oversight that was required of ASIO and his view that no agency, ASIO included, should operate outside of ministerial responsibility. Of course, that view now is completely orthodox across all sides of politics, but it took a courageous attorney like Lionel Murphy to make a point in that way, what was at great political cost, and in doing so demonstrated his own credentials about his view about the need for great scrutiny in this area. By contrast today, the modern Labor Party takes a different view. It's doing everything it can, possibly can to take a bipartisan view, to do everything it possibly can to satisfy the needs of ASIO and the other intelligence bodies, and critically to be seen in public as doing this. It does not want to be seen in any way as uh, uh, putting a spanner in the works of standing in the way of these measures, even to the extent of not wanting to be seen as critiquing them in a public and vigorous way. Now, of course, there's some wisdom to the Labor Party's modern approach, and that is, I think and do believe, that the Australian community faces a real threat from terrorism. I do believe that the government and the opposition need to act in a considered, well-thought-out way. I do believe that we need appropriate laws on the books to go through Parliament to ensure that agencies like ASIO are well-resourced and have the powers they need to protect the community. I'd say, though, that that need can't excuse a lack of vigilance and scrutiny on the part of an opposition or of parliament, and that measures of this kind deserve not just proper attention, but special attention. They deserve a careful, critical eye because of their extraordinary nature, and indeed a level of scrutiny that goes beyond ordinary statutes, rather than falling far below what we'd see for those other statutes. And that's because laws of this kind pose special dangers to the community and our democracy. It's well known around the world, and I've travelled to many places to look at how these issues have worked themselves through over the course of years and decades, that not only do democracies face external dangers, but dangers can arise from those who profess to protect that democracy. That sometimes the dangers can also arise from the executive, from governments given overwhelming powers, who have powers at their disposal which can be used to undermine democratic rights rather than merely to protect the rights of the citizens of the nation. What can happen at a time of community fear like we're in at the moment is that the unthinkable becomes possible. And this, of course, is a dynamic that is well known. It goes back centuries and it's something that people have studied going back as far as Alexander Hamilton writing in the 18th century in the lead up to the United States Constitution. He said of a like era, Safety from external danger is the most powerful director of national conduct. Even the ardent love of liberty will, after a time, give way to its dictates. The violent destruction of life and property incident to war, the continual efforts and alarm attendant on a state of continual danger, will compel nations the most attached to liberty to resort for repose and security to institutions which have a tendency to destroy their civil and political rights. To be more safe, they at length become willing to run the risk of being less free. And that dynamic is something that Australia has now been subject to since 2001 and the September 11 attacks. And what we've seen is repeated cycles of lawmaking that as the community has continually been concerned about, legitimately concerned about their safety, that we have traded off freedoms and become, if you like, hopefully more safe at the risk of becoming less free. It's a dynamic that was particularly evident in Australia in World Wars I and II with the national security laws and regulations that were passed at those times. But there's something special about the current conflict that really distinguishes it from those other periods of Australian history. This period, this so-called war on terror, has no conceivable end. It's a war on a methodology, not a war on an identifiable en enemy or entity. And indeed, it's a war on a methodology that has been used from the earliest times of human history.
Indeed, it makes in many ways the anti-terror laws of greater significance than the exceptional measures of World Wars I and II. That's because those measures had a more definite duration. They naturally ended and were removed from the statute book at the end of those conflicts. Whereas by contrast, the war on terror has now run for a longer period than World Wars I and II combined. And indeed, in all likelihood, will run for at least as long again. What that suggests is that we're dealing here with changes to the law that aren't short term, they're not exceptional in terms of their timeliness, they're not transient, but we're dealing with measures that for all intensive purposes, unlike other periods, amount to permanent changes on the statute book. As such, what these measures are doing is fundamentally reshaping how we even understand the law in Australia. They're making inroads into human rights, which will endure. They're creating new precedents, understandings, expectations and conventions. In effect, we are rewriting the balance between liberty and security in Australia in a long-term, ongoing way by virtue of these laws. This is reflected not just in the laws themselves, but the fact that these laws are now making their way into other parts of the law. A good example are anti-terror control orders, which have been copied now in pretty much every state and territory in the country in the form of anti-bikey laws. Uh, Mike Rann, the South Australian Premier, justified the migration of anti-terror measures to the state level by saying, we're allowing for similar legislation to here that applies to terrorists because in our community, bikey groups are terrorists. And what we're finding is that rhetoric is being used at the state level to justify the migration of these measures. And what were once considered exceptional anti-terror measures only justified in that warlike setting are increasingly becoming used to prosecute the law and order debate at the state level. As legislators at the state level ever look for new ways to be tough on crime, terrorism measures are becoming more and more appealing. That's, for example, not just in the anti-bikey laws, but we're seeing it through the revival of offences for guilt by association, consorting, a range of offences at the state level are being revived by virtue of these anti-terror laws. Now, it's a lengthy introduction to make a fairly simple point, and that is that anti-terror laws require heightened, not lessened, scrutiny when it comes to their passage through the Australian Parliament. And it's why, as someone who studied such laws very closely for the best part of a decade, it's of such concern to me to see that this bill, 160 pages, dealing with some of the most significant anti-terror measures ever introduced in this country, will go through both Houses of Parliament in the space of four days next week, without the opportunity for a sustained public and media debate, and on the basis of committee findings, that by virtue of the bipartisan agreement preceding the committee meant that there was never any chance we'd see more substantive changes to the legislation. I think we need to recognise that in these circumstances there's a great danger here that not only will we be tough on terrorism, as we should, but that we'll be end up actually undermining the same democratic values that we're trying to protect from terrorists. So with this in mind, I want now to address three questions which seem to me to be vital to understanding whether this bill should be passed next week and to understand whether indeed we should be having new anti-terror laws in Australia. The first question is whether Australia should have any anti-terror laws whatsoever. The second question is, given we have anti-terror laws, what are they? One of the missing pieces in this debate is an analysis of the laws already on the books. And indeed, every time we go through a cycle of anti-terror law making, it tends to be on the basis that it's a clean slate. Surely new powers are needed because nobody really remembers the powers that have already been enacted. And thirdly, based upon those two questions, I'll answer the third question, do we need new laws? Do we need new anti-terror laws in particular? So turning to that first question, does Australia need any anti-terror laws? We had none at all nationally prior to September 11. In fact, Australia came very late to the party in enacting such laws compared to the United States, the United Kingdom and other nations. It reflected our very limited experience of terrorism at home. You can look to the 1978 bombing attack at the Sydney Hilton as a, an isolated example of an act of terrorism in Australia. But we had little first-hand experience and it really required the events of September 11 to galvanise our politicians to fundamentally change their perception as to whether such laws were required in Australia. What also, of course, changed their perception was the assessment of our government that Australians do face a real threat of terrorism within our domestic borders. That was reflected in the fact that uh, we've had a terrorism alert system, which from 2003 was set at the level of medium. 
Now, if you originally went to the terrorism alert system and tried to look up what medium meant to actually get a sense of well, just how dangerous, uh, what danger were we facing, it originally said that the medium level meant that we suffered a medium likelihood of attack. Um, that, of course, did not take us very far. Unfortunately, the scheme has since been updated, and medium now means a terrorist attack could occur, which doesn't take us a lot further, but somewhat further. And, of course, now, for the first time, by virtue of the threat of fighters returning from Iraq and Assyria, the terrorism threat has been raised to high, which means that a terrorist attack is likely. Now, I don't have any inside information to cast doubt upon those assessments. And, in fact, what I see internationally and from what I know domestically, I think justifies the view that Australia does face the real threat of terrorism at home. It is quite likely that a person might seek with a radical intent and based upon training that they have received to cause grave harm to the community by undertaking acts of terrorism. I've certainly looked carefully at the 38 people and more who have been charged with acts of terrorism and the evidence put in those proceedings does demonstrate clearly that we do have people within our community willing to undertake these acts. So it's on that basis that the Australian Government has taken the view that anti-terror laws are needed to meet that threat. It's been responded with equally strongly that no such laws are needed because the ordinary criminal law is sufficient to deal with the threat of terrorism and no new laws are needed. After all, we've got laws dealing with murder, assault, a very broad range of criminal offences that directly apply to most acts of terrorism. Now, my own view has always been that uh, the criminal law was not sufficient, even given the strength of that argument that even given the protections built into the criminal law, that extra anti-terror laws were required, in particular to deal with aspects of terrorism that are not encompassed by the criminal law. For example, I've always felt that we needed anti-terror laws directed at the financing of terrorism, laws directed specifically at targeting terror cells and other aspects of terrorism that were not adequately dealt with in the criminal law. I've also taken the view that the criminal law was not sufficiently focused to preventing acts of terrorism, and that special intervention with regard to terrorism is justified given the possibility for catastrophic harm being caused by terrorists, and so the criminal law need to be sharpened with anti-terror specific offences to prevent that loss of life, indeed to protect the right to life, which of course is one of the most fundamental human rights. Now the fact that I would say we need new criminal sanctions about terrorism, of course raises questions of proportionality. And I'm not suggesting anything goes, but I would say that I think there is a strong and justifiable case to enact anti appropriate anti-terror laws. I'd also say that there's a strong case to ensure that the anti-terror laws confer appropriate powers on agencies such as the Australian Federal Police and ASIO. Much better that powers of surveillance identify attacks early. Much better also that the police have the ability to apprehend people before they take stronger steps towards committing a terrorist act. And I think here there were clear gaps within the regime that did need to be filled with appropriate anti-terror laws. I think we're also justified in enacting such laws to be a good international citizen. Resolution 1373 of the United Nations Security Council required us to take all necessary steps to prevent the commission of terrorist acts. Our law was directed at prosecuting such people, primarily after the event, but having laws directed more to the prevention of terrorism was something consistent with that international mandate. There's also an important moral dimension to this. After attacks in New York, Mumbai, Madrid, Jakarta and other places, criminalising acts of violence committed in order to further political, religious or ideological aims is an appropriate step, I believe, for the Australian community and its parliaments. Putting all of that together, my research and thinking has led me to the view that we do need anti-terror laws in this country that indeed our governments and parliaments deserve credit for recognising that, fulfilling what, with the benefit of hindsight, are very significant gaps in the law. The question then is not do we need anti-terror laws, but what laws do we actually need? And that's where some of the problems emerge. And that's where I'm now going to turn to the question of, given that need, what laws do we actually have on the books? Prior to this, what has been enacted in this country to deal with this problem? Australia's response to terrorism was similar to other nations in the sense that it emphasised the need to deviate from the ordinary criminal law, to provide exceptional, exceptional sanctions to intervene early. But our response nonetheless went much further than a number of other countries, even the United States and the United Kingdom. 
we have introduced measures in Australia that are not found in those other countries. And as someone who often travels to conferences in those places, I can't tell you the number of times people have asked me, why has Australia done this or that? Why did you see the need for this measure when the United States did not? And it's quite striking in comparing our measures to other nations, just how much further we have gone in some respects to comparators such as the United States. One of the remarkable features of this legislation is just how many of these laws have actually been enacted. Australia, it seems, has developed somewhat of an addiction to enacting national anti-terror laws. And since September 11, 62 separate pieces of federal legislation, not including a, a large number of state and territory bills, have been enacted through the national parliament. The high point of enacting these laws was during the Prime Minister Howard's coalition government up until November 2007. And over that period, from 2001 to 2007, 48 separate anti-terrorist statutes were enacted. It averaged a new statute every six and a half weeks over that period of time. And I can tell you as someone who commented on a vast number of those, what an exhausting period that was. These were laws that were often of great length, enormous complexity, that simply exhausted the opposition and the media, and after an initial flurry in debate, most of them slipped through without much attention whatsoever. And these are laws like the current one that were often subject to an expedited process, and so as a result, never got much attention at all. One person who has studied these laws, Kent Roach from the University of Toronto, has compared Australia to other democratic nations and has described our parliament as being caught up in hyper-legislation. In fact, his chapter on Australia is called hyper-legislation. He has said, and I quote, Australia has exceeded the United Kingdom, the United States and Canada in the sheer number of new anti-terror laws it has enacted since 9-11. And he describes our parliament as getting caught up in the 9-11 effect of being engaged in a degree of legislative activism, which is striking compared even to the United States. And it's nice to see activism applied to our parliaments and not just to our courts, I must say, for once. But of course, the number itself only tells a small part of the story. It gives you a sense that Australia in this area has gone through a more sustained lawmaking period on any subject, on this subject more than any other subject in its history. I'm not aware of any period in our history we have, we have enacted so many laws in such a concentrated period of time on a single topic. That's striking. But what's most important is not the volume, but of course the reach of these laws. And that's where they are truly extraordinary compared to many of these other countries. The hinge or the key fact in these laws is of course in defining a terrorist act. And that definition is the fulcrum upon which almost all of the powers in this area turn. You commit a terrorist act if you commit an act of violence or damage property or disrupt an electronic system for a political, religious or ideological cause where you're trying to coerce a government or intimidate a section of the public. And those elements do describe accurately what, in essence, terrorism is. It's an act of violence to try and intimidate people. It's committed for ideology or other reasons. But what that definition doesn't capture is the recognition in our society that many acts that fit that description are described as acts of liberation. Of course, Nelson Mandela, without doubt, is a terrorist under this definition. People have re resisted the Syrian regime are terrorists. The struggle in East Timor was conducted by terrorists. The American War of Independence was conducted by terrorists. Indeed, the nature of this area is whether you're labelled a terrorist tends very much to be dependent upon how you're viewed with the eye of history after the event. It depends a sense of perspective. It depends upon a sense of actually understanding the full context in which something has occurred. But those are matters which aren't captured, and I suspect could never be adequately captured in our definition. At least in the case of South Africa, with their definition, they exclude freedom fighters. You could imagine they don't want Nelson Mandela to be a terrorist under their own laws. We don't do that, and as a result, our definition is very broad in capturing a range of conduct that we would regard as legitimate in fighting against despotic, uh, often totalitarian regimes. Based upon that definition, there's a range of new criminal offences, including committing a terrorist act, simply preparing for a terrorist act, my favourite is possessing anything connected with terrorism, where thing is not defined in any way. And uh, you could find yourself possessing a thing that appears to be innocuous, but it has some connection to terrorism in some way. And without you having even full knowledge of that connection, you can find yourself guilty and subject to a very lengthy jail term. Most of the offences bite very, very early. And what they do, combined with things such as conspiracy and the like, 
is provide offences that can catch people at the earliest stages without them even having any plan to commit terrorism, but perhaps having had a conversation or perhaps having bought something that might lend itself to the commission of such an act. In fact, these days, the most common offence people are charged with is conspiracy to do an act in preparation for a terrorist act. So it's combining conspiracy, preparation and other elements that go very early to what terrorism is about. We've also got remodelled sedition offences, which mean that people can be jailed for seven years merely for their speech. The government now can conduct warrantless searches, which means that your property can be searched without any judicial or other authorisation. We've got longer investigation periods for terrorism offences that mean that someone could be detained for up to a week or more uh, to answer questions from the police, or in Dr Hanif's case, before the law was changed 12 days. The Attorney General, without any independent advice or any requirement for an independent decision maker, can ban organisations because the Attorney believes they're preparing for terrorism or advocating terrorism through their speech. We have preventative detention orders, something that's not found in com comparable countries, where a person can be essentially disappeared for up to two weeks by the police, where there's a sense that a terrorist act might be committed or that they want to preserve evidence. If you are detained under a preventative detention order, you can make a call to your spouse and all you can say is, I'm safe, but I'm not able to be contacted for the time being. Now, I'm not sure what you'd think if your spouse had that phone call and you suddenly didn't hear from them for two weeks. You might Google safe but not able to be contacted for the time being and then you'd find they're under a preventative detention order. But um, it's something in that case that is more akin to what you'd expect in a police state rather than a democracy, the notion of people being disappeared in those circumstances. We have a control order regime, which the United Kingdom did have and we copied it, but the control orders have now been repealed in the United Kingdom on the basis they're too intrusive. We've kept that. It means that without any findings of guilt or innocence, a person can have every aspect of their liberty controlled, who they can talk to, what technology they can use. They can be subjected to house arrest for many, many hours a day. The most extraordinary is ASIO's questioning and detention power, which means that a person can be potentially detained for up to a week. And once detained, a person, it might be an innocent person who's a journalist hiding a source, or a family member, for example, if that person does not answer ASIO's questions, that person can be jailed for five years. Again, that's, even Israel doesn't have a regime of that kind. I've talk, talked to people in Israel and they say, why do you give your domestic spy agency the ability to detain civilians who are not suspected of crimes, and how could you possibly jail them for five years for not answering the questions of that agency? Um, only Australia, to my knowledge, does that among any democratic nation. If a journalist writes a story about ASIO's detention of someone, the journalist can be jailed for five years. And uh, even if that's a story revealing that ASIO is misusing its powers, and I'm not suggesting ASIO does, I have a very high regard for the agency, but the fact that a journalist can be jailed for writing a public interest story is deeply concerning in this respect. We've also got new powers of electronic surveillance that apply not just to suspects, but anyone who communicates with a terrorist suspect. So, for example, it applies to lawyers who are advising terrorist suspects. And indeed, there are no exceptions for legal professional privilege that might protect those communications. The Attorney General has enhanced powers to close down courtrooms and to request a judge to redact or hide evidence. And when deciding whether to close down a courtroom, a judge is explicitly directed by the legislation to give, and I quote, the greatest weight to national security over the right to a fair trial. We've also got a new censorship regime that means that any publication, book or film or computer game can be banned where it advocates terrorism. Certainly Nelson Mandela's biography, autobiography, could be banned under this measure. It advocates what he did as a resistance to apartheid. But one of the remarkable things there is that things can be banned not just because they advocate terrorism, but because, according to the legislation, of how a person, and I quote, with a mental impairment might react to that book, film or computer game. I mean, it's a very rare instance where the law is actually based not upon the reasonable person, but upon how a person with a mental impairment might respond. And if a person with a mental impairment might be more likely to commit a terrorist act, that's a basis for banning that publication. Now, that's a snapshot of the high points of this legislation. And of course, there's much more. And you can add the ordinary criminal law, incitement to violence and other speech offences and the like. But what you see from the existing laws is the Australian government has formidable, extraordinary and lengthy powers to combat terrorism.
Not only that, these powers have been specifically drafted in many cases to deal with the problem of people returning, particularly from Afghanistan. This question of foreign fighters is not new, even though the scale of it is. The number of people returning is significantly larger. People seem to forget, though, that we have these laws on the books and that many are drafted, like control orders, exactly for the sort of problems that we're facing today. Well, given that background, I want to ask the question, do we need more anti-terror laws? And let me say immediately that the answer is partially yes. And that's because we should never be complacent in this area. To be frank, there's many problems in the existing law. Many of the powers simply don't work. They'll rush through Parliament so quickly that they're ineffective when it comes to the ability of agencies to even use them. Some go too far and should be wound back. So I would never suggest we ought not to ever have new laws in this area. The question always is, what laws do we need and what is appropriate? The government's announced three tranches of legislation. We've already had the enactment of the National Security Legislation Amendment Act on 1 October, so earlier this month. It covers things like uh, surveillance by ASIO and uh, other related matters. The bill next week, the Foreign Fighters Bill, deals what's well, meant to deal primarily with returning foreign fighters, but actually deals with a much larger range of matters as well. And then later in the year, we'll apparently have a bill dealing with metadata, requiring the retention for up to two years of telecommunications and other information. Now, having looked at the two bills we've got so far, the one that's passed and the one that's for debate next week, it's clear to me some of these measures are well justified. Um, I think, for example, it's entirely appropriate that we modernise the legislation so that ASIO's powers extend to new forms of technology. Uh, it was very much hampered in that it was subject only to computer-based warrants without being able to monitor networks as well. We've also got unwieldy procedures about cancelling people's passports. I think it is appropriate that passports can be suspended on an emergency basis. Better pre to prevent people leaving the country in the first place if you've got a legitimate concern, rather than prosecuting them after the event. I think also there's evidentiary problems with prosecuting people under the Foreign Incursions Act who go to places like Syria. And so measures to make it easier to introduce appropriate evidence into courts is also welcome. These sort of measures, I think, are urgent, are necessary, and in fact, I'd say some of them should have been enacted months ago. In fact, some of them a few years ago. And what's striking is that some of the measures that have been thrust upon us so quickly are measures that have actually been suggested over a very long period of time. But what we've got is a manufactured sense of emergency to pass measures that, in some cases, should already be on the statute books. In other cases, the measures, in my view, are just unjustified, in fact, often ill-conceived. And in this respect, the attempt to embark upon what is the largest expansion in these laws since 2005 is particularly unwelcome. What we're seeing as part of this is the familiar ratcheting up of these laws. You almost never, ever see a government willing to actually ratchet them down, to have a sense that some things don't work, that experience suggests that some things can be safely wound back. All we get is a ratcheting up as we look for more and more ways in which we can have tough anti-terror measures. And indeed, the current measures again demonstrate that. In the bill that's already passed, uh, we've got, as I've said, the idea of extending ASIO's power to computer networks, which I support. But unfortunately, there, computer networks is not defined. And indeed, instead of granting ASIO the power only to surveil those parts of the computer network that it has legitimate interest in, instead you can get a warrant that covers the whole network. And for example, at my university, where we've got some 50,000 people connected to a network, it's an issue of concern that the warrant covers that whole network and, only, and not only those relevant parts. We've also got now well reported, and the media has discovered it seems only after the bill was passed, that uh, the creation of ASIO's special intelligence operations by which it can get immunity from prosecution also contains a clause that can jail journalists and others for revealing any information relating to ASIO's special intelligence operations. The law simply says, and I quote, a person commits an offence if the person discloses information and the information relates to a special intelligence operation. There are no defences that apply to journalists or anything in that category. So if you in any circumstances reveal any information that in any way relates to one of these operations, you can be jailed for a lengthy period of time. As has been pointed out, if you report in the media that these operations have been abused, that power has been misused, that perhaps an innocent bystander has been killed, that perhaps there has been wrongdoing, 
you can be jailed for reporting on that. The whistleblower protections have no application in this respect. There is no capacity in those to go to the media. And it's now been said quite publicly, even by some of the most conservative commentators, that this will have a chilling effect on the media, and understandably so. Any journalist who is going to write stories about ASIO's operations run the risks of writing a story that in some way relates to one of these intelligence operations. And the journalist won't know. They're secret. You run the risk that your story will relate to it in some way and run the risk of facing jail. The bill next week um, has other measures which are also a cause for concern. We've got the measures that I've mentioned, the ASIO questioning and detention regime, preventative detention orders and control orders, all of which were due to expire from the beginning of, sorry, the end of next year. Now, they were regimes that the independent legislation monitor, Brett Walker, had all slated for repeal on the basis they were ineffective, not necessary, dangerous to our democracy, and had no comparator in any comparable nation. Now, the case in each of those situations was very strong to suggest repeal, or at least a very, very significant winding back. Instead, the government in the Foreign Fighters Bill said it wants to extend the sunset clause by which they will expire next year for 10 years, so they would instead expire in 2025 without in any way responding to the specific recommendations of Brett Walker or other reports, including the COAG review, which recommended the repeal of preventative detention orders. Now, to give you an example of the sort of things the parliamentary committee has come back with, it said, well, instead of having a new sunset clause for 2025, in effect, let's have one in 2018. And that's what the government has agreed to. So all we've got is a more modest extension of a regime that should not have been on the books and should not remain on the books, and it's hardly a clarion call for reform, hardly a legitimate listening to the evidence that's been put to the government by its own adviser. We've also got in this bill next week uh, a very extraordinary offence that will, for the first time, allow the Australian government to declare areas to be no-go zones. They can declare an area on the basis that there's been terrorist activity there, and that might be Iraq or Syria, but it could be Israel, Indonesia, or even, based upon past experience, the United States. Anyone who sets foot in that area is subject to 10 years jail. Now, you don't have to set foot with an illegitimate purpose. There's no requirement that you're there to commit a wrongful act. Merely being in that area is jailable by 10 years. You might live in the area. You might be a dual Australian Syrian citizen who lives there with your family. If you remain in that area, you'll be subject to 10 years jail. Now, what the law does is the government has listed what it regards as a small set of legitimate reasons for being in the area that do provide a defence. But you will bear the onus of making out at an evidentiary level that you can show that defence. If you like, the onus is effectively reversed when it comes to the offence, to the defence. The defences include you're there to provide humanitarian aid or to visit a family member. But there is no defence if you're there to conduct business, you're there to visit a friend, you're there to go on a religious pilgrimage, or in fact, a vast list of reasons that might legitimately describe why you go to such an area. Not only that, it's been drafted so that it's only a defence if your sole purpose is to go there for one of the government's listed aims. So it's only if you're providing humanitarian aid. If you do that and visit a friend, you no longer are able to use the defence. It's actually going to be quite rare that someone can show the sole purpose is one of these tightly constricted bases. And what it means is that we've got an overbroad offence that severely restricts freedom of movement, and for the first time at that I'm aware in a liberal democracy, gives the government the ability to preemptively determine that people are subject to jail for 10 years merely for stepping foot in a particular area. We've also got new offences for advocating terrorism, whereby people can be jailed for five years for promoting or encouraging terrorist acts. And this, again, is subject to grave concerns about its scope. If, for example, on social media you like someone's Facebook posts and that Facebook post in some way says ISIS is doing the right thing or some way advocates terrorism such as the overthrow of the North Korean government, well, that's something that is advocating, encouraging, and you may well find that people are falling within the net of this simply for liking or being engaged in the actions of others. We've also got extended grounds for banning terrorist organisations. The organisations can be banned because they also promote terrorism. 
But not only the leaders of the organisation, but any person who is a member can be jailed. You could find yourself a member of a community organisation that wrong-headedly supports the actions of ISIS. You may fundamentally disagree with the statements of that organisation, but the fact you're a member is enough to subject you to 10 years jail for speech you have not said and actually disagree with. And given here the desire to build social cohesion and not to raise concerns in the Muslim community, it's quite remarkable uh, what's being proposed there. What's equally remarkable is, I think, in this space that the government seemingly without breath, drawing breath, has moved on from attacking Section 18C, which has no criminal sanctions attached to it, to now proposing jail terms of up to 10 years for speech. It really suggests, unfortunately, in this respect, when it comes to freedom of speech, a very undesirable authoritarian streak, which has nothing, it seems, to do with its prior advocacy for exactly that freedom. So in conclusion, as I've said in this speech, I'm someone who does think Australia needs anti-terror laws and indeed supports new anti-terror laws. And there are some sensible measures within the government's proposals. What we're seeing, though, is unfortunately yet another cycle of overreaction and overreach. We're seeing that in a way that differs to other countries that demonstrates, again, some of the weaknesses in our own political and legal system. In those other countries, such as the United States, they have a Bill of Rights or the Human Rights Act in the United Kingdom, similar to what Lionel Murphy argued for himself in 1973 in the form of a Human Rights Bill that he was unable to get through the Australian Parliament. In those countries, they have a debate on these bills constrained by basic democratic values that has a marked impact upon the laws actually enacted. By contrast, in Australia next week, I suspect you'll find not many, if any, references to these same basic values, except perhaps by way of referencing to say how, how important it is we sacrifice some of them in the name of community safety. In Australia, compared to those other nations, when we look at these areas and ask, well, what are the checks and balances to make sure our politicians don't go too far, the answer lies almost completely within the political realm. The question is, to what extent can we trust the wisdom and good sense of our elected representatives to get it right? Because legally, the checks and balances simply are not there. And of course, in these areas where the community is prone to overreact, it's even worse when it comes to the politicians in government of all political persuasions. Not only are they prone to overreact, but they achieve a political benefit in doing so. Of course, there are great opportunities for governments to be tough on terrorism. And even if they do so at the cost of fundamental human rights, that's hardly a vote loser in Australia. I think all this goes to show that Australia's anti-terror laws do expose some basic structural problems in Australia within our democracy. They reveal the fact that many of the most important principles that we take for granted, like freedom of speech, in fact are merely only assumptions and conventions that we rely upon our politicians to honour. But in some circumstances, such as national security and anti-terror laws, that's often not the case. Now, it's on this note I want to finish with a quote, not actually from Lionel Murphy, but from one of his political opponents, because one of the antidotes, surely, for a coalition government is a healthy respect for liberalism and individual liberty. And in this respect, uh, Australia's longest-serving Prime Minister, Sir Robert Menzies, said some very important words, I think, at the onset of World War II, where on 3 September 1939, Menzies announced that Australia is at war and foreshadowed the fact that there would be a grave loss of life as a result of that to Australian citizens. Four days later, Menzies introduced the National Security Bill of 1939 into Parliament in the face of what was a very grave threat to our national security, indeed the gravest that we have faced in our existence as a nation. Now, unlike Prime Minister Tony Abbott, who talked of the need to sacrifice our liberties in favour of national security, this is how Menzies described the debate and what he was seeking to do in bringing about strong national security reforms. Whatever may be the extent of the power that may be taken to govern, to direct and to control by regulation, there must be as little interference with individual rights as is consistent with concerted national effort. The greatest tragedy that could overcome a country would be for it to fight a successful war in defence of liberty, only to lose its own liberty in the process. Now, unfortunately, that's a sentiment with which I agree, but I suspect a sentiment that you won't hear much of in Parliament next week. Thank you.
Well, thanks very much, George, for that very powerful address. I couldn't help thinking on the way through what a pity this isn't being piped into the parliament and the politicians required to listen to it uh, over the next few days. I now call upon Geraldine Turner uh, to move a vote of thanks to George. She's um, a, a, another trustee from the Lionel Murphy Foundation. Thank you, David. Well, what a ride, what a lecture. Um, certainly clear, succinct, ever engaging and deeply thought-provoking. We live in scary times and it's, um, it's a worry to think that our liberties uh, are in peril. Um, I believe they are. Uh, listening to all of that, I will certainly be thinking about this lecture in the coming days, in the coming weeks, and uh, we'll certainly watch next week in Parliament when these, um, this bill goes through, and uh, uh, I won't like that much at all. Uh, <laughs> the Lionel Murphy Foundation is very grateful that Professor George Williams has given up his time to speak to us this evening. Uh, I would like you to please join me in thanking him for this really important and thought-provoking lecture. Thank you. <laughs> also, we do have refreshments outside where we can talk to each other and uh, debrief and talk to Professor Williams if he stays for some refreshments. So we invite you to join us and uh, onward and upward. Thank you.